Here I've got this interesting double sum which depends on a parameter and we're going to find the closed form of this double sum. So we've got the sum as m and n go from 1 to infinity of m squared n over a to the m times n a to the m plus m a to the n. And this is going to be for real numbers a that are larger than 1. And now we can check that this converges using like series converging tests for double series. I won't do that here, but a clue that it's going to converge is the fact that we've got exponential stuff in the denominator and polynomial stuff in the numerator. But also this is a sum of positive terms. But since it's a sum of positive terms, we know it absolutely converges. But if it absolutely converges, we can change the order of summation. And then furthermore, we're going to use the sum of a geometric series fact, which I have down here. But we're probably all pretty familiar with that. Okay, so my first step will be to really multiply this by 2 over 2. But the way I'll do that is multiply this by a half and then write this as the sum added to itself. So I've got the sum as m and n go from 1 to infinity of m squared n over a to the m and then n a to the m plus m a to the n. And then I'm going to rewrite exactly the same sum but in the next version of the sum I'm going to exchange m and n. And there's motivation built into this expression right here to do that because, well, this object right here that's in parentheses in the denominator has some symmetry built in. So let's notice that it is symmetric upon the exchange of m and n. The rest of it isn't, but that gives us a hint that exchanging m and n would be fruitful. Okay, so let's do that. We've got the sum as m and n go from 1 to infinity. Now it'll be m n squared over a to the n. And then we'll have m a to the n plus n a to the m. Okay, great. But now let's look at this and notice that this stuff in parentheses is exactly the same. It's been reordered, but it's exactly the same uh, across both sums. So that motivates us to pull it out. Furthermore, the numerator is pretty similar. Notice this numerator is m times mn, whereas this numerator is n times mn. So we can also pull out the mn that's in the numerator. Okay, so let's do that and see what this looks like. So we'll have a half and we'll have the sum as m and n go from 1 to infinity. And then we'll have mn over n a to the m plus m a to the n. And then what's left over after we do that? Well, in the first sum, we'll have m over a to the m. So let's write that down, m over a to the m. And then in the second sum, we'll have n over a to the n. So that's some nice like kind of symmetry there as well. Okay, nice. Now, next up what I'll do is find a common denominator for these two terms and add them up and see if we get any simplification out of that. So notice the common denominator will be a sub m times a sub n. In other words, a sub m plus n. And after adding that together, we'll have m a to the n plus n a to the m over a to the m times a to the n. Okay, nice. Oh, but notice that that has an m a to the n plus n a to the m in the numerator, whereas here it's in the denominator. So that means we can do some simplification. So this term will cancel this term, and what will we be left with? Well, we'll be left with 1 half, and then we have the sum as m and n go from 1 to infinity of... I'm going to write this as m over a to the m plus times n over a to the n. So notice it's a sum of m terms times n terms.
But that means that we can factor this into two sums instead of one double sum. This is like the difference between an iterated integral and a double integral. So at this point, this is a double sum, but because of the structure of our summands here, we're able to write it as an iterated sum, if you will. Okay, so let's do that. And while we do that, I'm gonna factor some stuff out of the denominator. I'm gonna, in fact, write this as one over two a squared, and then we'll have the sum as m goes from one to infinity of m over a to the m minus one, and then times the sum as n goes from one to infinity of n over a to the n minus one. And I'm gonna do that because now it looks like some derivative has been taken. Look, we've got the power here, which is m minus one, which is one less than the coefficient we have. This will become even more clear if we take this and rewrite it as m times one over a to the m minus one. And likewise, we can take this and rewrite it as n times one over a to the n minus one. Okay, nice. Now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna rewrite it as a limit of power series. Okay, so let's do that. And this is all towards using this trick down here. So we have one over two a squared, and then we'll have the limit as x and y both approach one over a. So I'll just write it like that. X and y are both approaching one over a. And then we'll have the sum as m goes from one to infinity of m times x to the m minus one. And then here we'll have the sum as n goes from one to infinity of n times y to the n minus one. Okay, cool. Now let's look at each of these and note that they are derivatives. So this is the derivative with respect to x of x to the m. So I, I think that's pretty clear. And then this is the derivative with respect to y of y to the n. Again, that's pretty clear by the power rule. So now I'll take this and I'll bring all of my stuff down. So that'll be my one over two a squared. My limit as x, y, x and y, I should say, go to one over a. And then I'll have the second partial derivative. One is with respect to x and one is with respect to y of the sum as m goes from, actually, I'm gonna argue that I can now start this sum at m equals zero. And that's because notice I'm multiplying by m here. If I multiply by zero, I'll get zero, but that means the zeroth term here is zero. Same thing there, I can start both of those at zero. That motivates me to start this one at zero as well. So let's see, zero to infinity of x to the m, and then the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of y to the n. But now I've got geometric series here. I can use my geometric series trick. So let's see, can bring all of my stuff down. So my constant and then my limit as well. And then I'll have my second partial, one with respect to x and one with respect to y of one over one minus x times one minus y. Okay, nice. But now taking that partial derivative is not too tricky. And that's because I've got a product of a function of x here and a function of y here. So I just need to take the x function with respect to x and the derivative of the y function with respect to y. And in the end, that'll give us one over one minus x times one minus y. Well, maybe both of them squared. So something like that. So that means I've got one over two times a, and then I've got my limit as x goes to one over a, and I guess y also goes to one over a, of one over one minus x squared times one minus y squared. Okay, nice. But now I can put these both together to have one over two a squared, and then I'll have, let's see, and then I'll have one over one minus one over a raised to the fourth power because I'm getting a square for both of them. And then maybe the path here is to rewrite this one 
minus one over a as a minus one over a. Just finding a common denominator here. And I guess I should say that this is all hinging on the fact that this convergence happens when the absolute value of x is less than one by this rule here. But if a is bigger than one, then one over a is less than one. So we're good to go there. Okay, so now notice this a to the fourth, which is in the denominator of the denominator, we'll flip up to the numerator, we'll cancel this a squared, and we'll be left with one half, and then we'll have a squared in the numerator, and a minus one to the fourth in the denominator. And that would be our final value of this sum. And that's a good place to stop.